Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages. Welcome to Sunday Night History Chat. Thank you so much for joining me. It is Sunday, March 3rd, 2024. I would like to welcome you to my library and I'm looking forward to our discussion this evening uh, and to see what kind of places we can go in whatever your questions are. If you're new to my library, please drop a note. Let us know where you are watching from uh, and um, just whatever you would like to chat about this evening. Uh, we will uh, see what is going on. Um, nothing else going on in this week for me. I do not have any upcoming events this week, uh, but I will on uh, March 16th be hanging out uh, in Yancey County, signing books uh, and uh, chatting with folks. I'll have more information about that uh, in the near, very near uh, future. And uh, we'll see where uh, that conversation goes and what all we can do about it. would like to say good evening to Tom Belton. Uh, Tom is writing that new book uh, on North Carolina's Confederate flags. And I am really looking forward to seeing that. Uh, in the near future, I've seen little bits and pieces of it, uh, but it's about North Carolina's Confederate flags or Civil War flags that are held there at the State Archives or the State Museum. Sorry, the State Museum there in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, and lots of other good things about North Carolina history uh, and Confederate history and Civil War history coming out uh, in the pipes. Uh, just lots of really, really good stuff. Uh, and I look forward to um, seeing more of that in the near future. Yes, I am. Just like that. So, uh, sorry, slight technical difficulty right there for just a few minutes. Um, would like to say good evening to Jason and David and Robert and Corey and William and Scott Young in Saratoga, New York, uh, West Combs. I uh, hope everybody is doing really well. Uh, Bobby Joe Goodson in, in Arkansas and um, just everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. So we're going to bring our guest up this evening. Uh, I have known uh, Wade for several years. We have signed books together uh, at the um, Bennett Place State Historic Site and a couple of other places we've been together in the past. And um, Wade's got a really fantastic book, Volume 1. It's called North Carolina's Confederate Hospitals. I really enjoyed it. I didn't just say that because my name is on the back of the book. Uh, it's just, just really, really good stuff uh, that Wade is doing. Uh, and so, um, Wade, I'd like to start off with a question this evening. Um, why write another book about the war? Well, Mike, first of all, let me say thanks for having me on and, and thanks to all the, uh, the folks who are tuning in tonight to listen. Why write another book about the war? Um, well, you know what? When You know my history when it comes to writing because I'm more of 1865. I'm, I'm more of the mm -hmm. Carolinas campaign. And when, when Mark Smith and I finished up uh, the, the book on the Battle of the Wise's Forks over in Kinston, um, you know, we're looking at what to do next. And, and the question was that I proposed was what happened to all the wounded from these four big battles here in a four 14 day period in March of 65 that culminated at Bentonville. Um, you know, I, so my focus was going to be on the wounded from these battles in the hospitals, bringing something in on the hospitals. But as I dug into it, Michael, it was like, because some of these hospitals that the wounded from Aversboro and Wise Fork, wherever went to, were established early on in the war, uh, late 61, early 62. So I'm like, OK, well, what's the history on these hospitals? And when I went when I went to go look for a book, <laughs> there's nothing written on North Carolina Civil War hospitals. I don't care whether you're talking blue or gray. Now, there's been folks like yourself who've focused on certain geographical areas like you focused on Charlotte and a few folks down in Wilmington and Raleigh as well. But, you know, it, it was a hole in the history, North Carolina Civil War history. I mean, it, it's it's a very niche subject. It's it's just specifically on hospitals, but there was nothing out there. And I, I felt moved to take it beyond just 1865 
um, but but cover the the full the whole story to tell the story from the beginning of the war to the end. And so I think I was lucky in that aspect because there's really not been anything written on uh, on a holistic view of the hospitals here in the state beyond what what you you've done and a few other folks done on more geographical reasons. You you know we could probably say that about most states. Um, you know, there's a book on Richmond hospitals in the war. Uh, mm-hmm. there's a book, small book on South Carolina hospitals and the war. Yeah. That's uh, Rebecca Calcott. Yep. She's done. Yep. She did Richmond and she did South Carolina too. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then there are just a couple of books, um, uh, about hospitals, especially in the army of Tennessee. And that's, unless we go broad, like doctors in gray, um, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's it. You know, well, and and Gettysburg. There are a lot of books about hospitals. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, of course, <laughs> uh, but no other battle. I mean, you know, where's the book on Chickamauga hospitals or you know Chancellorsville hospitals? Uh, that's you know just. Um, I, I think the the medical care overall is is really neglected. Um, we can write. Uh, there's a great book over there called Morrows of Tragedy, which is a really good book. Uh, but, you know, it looks at both sides at kind of this broad picture uh, of the war. And then, you know, when we get into the the nitty gritty or, you know, the, the field hospitals or, you know, um, the house hospitals or church hospitals, there's really nothing outside, you know, really nothing out there. Um, and, and I recognized that when I wrote, uh, General Lee's Immortals. So I had this whole chapter on brigade medical care, uh, and, and putting that stuff together. Uh, so, um, how do you, how, how did you come up with this list of hospitals? Um, if, if y'all don't know, and I kind of alluded to it before, uh, volume one is out and was released, what, two years ago? It was yes. released. Uh, two years ago, and then volume two is in the works and will maybe be out by uh, this time next year. Yeah, we're uh, we're shooting for the one sixtieth at Fort Fisher to be the uh, the release of the event. Awesome. The um, h- h- how do you find these hospitals? Well, you know, as like any researcher, you kind of go f- wh- where's the primary sources and the secondary right. sources. And and I started with we're lucky here in North Carolina. You know, we've got Walter Clark's five volumes. Uh, of, of regiments and battalions and such. Well, in volume four, uh, Surgeon Peter E. Hines wrote a very short 22-page piece called The Medical Corps for North Carolina. Uh, and that proved to be the, the, the jumping off point. Um, but what was interesting, Michael, was is that, um, you know, he even, in his very last paragraph in, in this short story on Medical Corps, he he makes the comment in words, you know, I wrote this 36 years after the war with nothing in front of me to remind me. um, So just be careful there, reader. (laughs) And when I, when I, when I started with his list and then as I delved more and more into it, I I realized that, you know, Peter Hines, he left early in the war, September, September, I mean, excuse me, uh, early in the war and went, went off with the first North Carolina volunteers with D.H. Hill, Robert Hoke. They fight the Battle of Big Bethel. He's the regimental surgeon. He quickly becomes a rising star of the North Carolina Medical Department. He doesn't return home in, to serve in his native state until September 63. So there's a gap in there. Right. And, and what I discovered was noticeably absent was these hospitals that were primarily on the coast. And then when Ambrose Burnside showed up in 62, you know, we North Carolina lost like five of its general hospitals, uh, two in Newburn, one in Little Washington, one in Carolina City, which is now part of Moorhead City. So um, and, and, and Peter Hines wasn't around to uh, he, did, he couldn't tell that story because he didn't serve in North Carolina at that time. So noticeably absent from his list was all these other hospitals. And, right. and as I continued to delve in, it's sometimes it can just be just one one uh, uh, hospital steward record where he bought a dozen eggs right. for the hospital. That, that could be the only thing that exists primary source wise is that one document. But you know what? It, it's signed by the hospital steward, purchased a dozen eggs for 50 cent. <laughs> so there was a hospital there. So that's kind of how I started. I, I, I went with what was already out there. 
and kind of use that as a as a as a mark on the wall to right. grow from and that's kind of how it was so is is volume gonna volume two gonna just look at confederate hospitals or are we going to talk about yes volume, volume two three is going to be at... a continu- yes volume two is going to be a continuation of north carolina's confederate hospitals volume one just takes it up to 1863 and a lot right. of that had to do with with covid covid hit uh because i initially started this project thinking it was going to be 1865 um <clears throat> that was some of the only the records i pulled out of the national archives and and then when when I couldn't get back in there, mm-hmm. um, when COVID shut it down, that's when I just had a conversation with the uh, publisher and said, Hey, look, why don't we just make this two volumes and let's make you know, 61 to 63 is volume one. And now what I'm working on right now is volume two, 64 and 65. And, you know, it's, it's great collaboration when we were sending stuff back and forth because you you're focusing on battle of Plymouth now which right. happens to be one of the bigger opening battles in 64 here in North Carolina that really stresses the hospital system. And it's like chapter number two for me in the book, it will be battle right. of Plymouth. I've got own, my whole chapter just to it. I, I imagine we could probably do whole chapters on just about, you know, every battle from, you know, Plymouth to um, Fort Fisher to Bentonville to Averysboro to, whatever else it is that I'm missing there on that mental list, um, you know, because each one of them produced um, lots of Confederate casualties. And of course, by the time we get to Fort Fisher, Bentonville, you know, the South is really strapped, yeah, um, it you is. know, for transportation and resources uh, and, and, um, and medicines and, you know, uh, just, just really strapped. And, and once one, again, one of the things I'm going to do early on is for in volume one, I introduced the hospital personnel, um, whether right. it's the surgeons, stewards, the matrons, the nurses, the cooks, laundresses and stuff. But here in volume two, I'm going to commit a chapter, just like you just mentioned by 64 hospitals are struggling, uh, not just to get personnel to work staffing shortages, but also when it comes to food, to medicines and stuff like that. And and to me, it's a really fascinating story. You're focusing on that, but you had some here, like down in Wilmington, the hospitals literally established general hospital number four down there, literally established a fishery where they were, where they, they detailed soldiers out there. They worked the fishing nets. They brought the fish back in. They salted it up, put it in 55, 50 gallon barrels or whatever. And then send it up the railroad to the other yep. hospitals, and those stewards would purchase it. So there was some really unique uh, ways of uh, trying to work around those shortages. There were, and um, once again, another one of them on untold stories is those fisheries. Uh, I remember from the Plymouth research that they had fisheries going on after the battle. The Confederates did. When I was working on feeding the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, there before the spring campaign in um, May, April, May, 1862, you know, when the fish start running, they're out there sang hauling and building, Mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, traps and all of these other things to catch those fish. Um, Not so sure about the Western theater folks. Um, If anybody knows anything about fisheries by army of Tennessee soldiers, um, because there's not really a big body of water around Dalton or Osaka. But, hey, you never know what you can discover when you're researching. You never know what that next piece of paper is going to have on it uh, as you're in there in the archives digging and what kind of um, uh, rabbit trails that you get to um, chase. Uh, Was there something, Wade, that you found that made you go, huh, as you're doing your research um, for either volume one or volume two? Uh, that that really just piqued your interest? Well, f- the numbering system, for example. Right. Um, you typically hear, you know, general hospital, number one, um, number 10, number 11 thrown around. And I realized it wasn't just a, it wasn't a list. It was a constant moving target. And, right. and for example, general hospital number one, um, which is up in Kitchell Springs, in Kitchell, North Carolina, actually was in Weldon first. Uh, Weldon was the first location for General Hospital Number One, 
And then in 63, it becomes a way, wayside hospital. Mm -hmm. And then in the summer of 64, in, in response to the Overlands campaign, all the wounded are coming down from Virginia. You have the hospital in Kittrell and the hospital over at Wake Forest and number one. So the, and even in your neck of the woods, when you wrote about Charlotte, you know, general hospital number 10, well, you know, that's early war. And then they do away with 10 for a while, but then 10 comes back in the spring of April of 64 over in Salisbury. And mm -hmm. then when the new hospital, the wooden pavilion, 40 by 100 foot long, one story buildings uh, are completed in Charlotte, it now becomes number 11. So it right. could be, that was, that was a challenge there. And I, and I tell folks that, you know, if you're trying to hunt down your ancestor, your ancestor who died in, in number 10, Charlotte, uh, it, it could have been number 10 Salisbury and, and it goes all with the other ones as well like that. I found that to be very, uh, that was definitely chasing a rabbit down a hole trying to solve that. And I, actually, I'm still still trying to solve some of them. <laughs> I understand. I understand. You know, I, I wrote a blog post like a decade ago about North Carolina's Confederate hospitals and tried to number and list both the wayside hospitals and the the general hospitals and um i, I probably need to go back and clean that list up but uh, that's probably a whole new another post um, yeah i mean it, 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 i i think it boils down i finally come down to the realization that it, it has nothing to do with when they were established chronologically yeah. in time right it, it's almost like because that was part of a law that the Confederate Congress passed that that basically said you will number these hospitals and right. you will make them available for for you know for example you want to put Tar Hill boys in Tar Hill hospitals you want to keep the boys together from what state they come from and and it's almost like when when uh, Edward Covey who was the medical director down here in Raleigh implemented that that general order that ultimately comes down um, it's almost like he took a, a North Carolina Department of Transportation map. And said, OK, mm -hmm. I'm going to start up in the north at Weldon, go down mm -hmm. I-95. Weldon's number one. Wilson's number two. Goldsboro's number three. Let's go on down to Wilmington and, Ra and Wilmington get four and five. Now we're going to go over to Raleigh and work our way out into the Piedmont farther. And that's where mm -hmm. you get the higher numbers. And it's almost like, yeah, it, it was it was I came to that realization. But like I tell folks, it has nothing to do chronologically in time. Um, it was not the first one just because it's number one. That would just make sense to us to do it that way. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you know, the historian 160 years later, um, that, yeah. that would, you know, be all too convenient um, for us. So you mentioned uh, like the Overland campaign and the influx of wounded. Uh, a two part question Did uh, North Carolina um, get other states wounded because there were so many? That's part A. And then part B is, you know, with the wayside hospitals, um, were there any like Confederate funds coming? Because, you know, we had soldiers that would be heading to South Carolina or Georgia or someplace that we would be taking care of. But usually women uh, at the wayside hospitals would be taken care of. Mm -hmm. uh, and was that totally out of their own pocket? You know, to answer the first part, yes, North Carolina received soldiers from other states. <clears throat> mm -hmm that were literally transferred as part of, especially in response to the Overlands campaign. And they're trying to uh, make beds, available, increase the availability of beds in the Richmond and the uh, uh, Petersburg area hospitals for all the wounded that are coming in. They were literally put on the railroad and sent down to the Raleigh area hospitals and ultimately out into the Piedmont. Um, so yes, North Carolina will see, if you look at those patient registries, um, when, when private Wade from the 13th Virginia was entered in general number 13 in Raleigh, it's got all my information and stuff there, but, uh, yeah, predominantly North Carolinians, but yes, there are, there are soldiers from various States. Now the wayside hospitals is, that's one of the other things that was really shocked to my, to, to my understanding when I first went into this project was I thought all Confederate hospitals were Confederate army hospitals. OK, right. Um, part of the Army Medical Department. And, but soon I realized that early in the war, no, it wasn't. Um, North Carolina was very dependent upon privately operated uh, hospitals and, and, and a very generous 
folks in Raleigh from our state legislatures who appropriated money for the establishment of hospitals in Petersburg, specifically for boys from North Carolina. So you had both privately operated hospitals, state operated hospitals, and then obviously the traditional those that were ran by the Confederate Army or Confederate Medical Department. Now, as the war goes on and, and uh, Surgeon General Preston Moore, Samuel Preston Moore, becomes more centralized control, uh, you see less private, less state operated, more centrally government uh, Confederate Medical Department. But yes, the Wayside's hospitals, for example, all those initially established in North Carolina were throughout the Confederacy because the Surgeon General didn't like the idea. Uh, mm -hmm. He didn't bless. He, he, he wasn't uh, he wasn't willing to throw uh, surgeons and money um, into a hospital system that he thought was very inefficient because, one, they're typically very small. They're not they're not large things, maybe 25, 30 beds, maybe at most. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't warm to them. Um, but the Confederate Congress was. And once again, they modified that law later on in uh, early 63, I believe if my memory serves me correctly. So by April of 1863, the Confederate Army, I mean, Surgeon General Moore pretty much got told you will establish these hospitals. And that's where you see here in North Carolina that some of these early hospitals that wayside hospitals that were either privately operated, like in Salisbury, for example, in Charlotte, for example, mm -hmm. those were the ladies who established those. Uh, they raised the money. They didn't get any help from the Confederate Medical Department because the Surgeon General didn't agree with them. So that they, they relied on um, raising money the generous, uh, generous donations of food and such. The local doctors in the in the town or or the area would come by and and take care of these soldiers. But as the war progressed and the Confederate Medical Department started taking over these waysides, then they then the, then they got allocated money from the Confederate Medical Department. You know, I I don't think that that. I don't think a lot of times we think of that logistical part of uh, the, the Confederate hospital system. Uh, you know, we think usually when f anybody thinks of it, you know, they think of those uh, hospitals, you know, right behind the front lines uh, that are, are bandaging up soldiers and sending them further to the rear and further to the rear can be North Carolina or South Carolina. Uh, uh, eventually, you know, just trying exactly. to exactly in North those. Carolina when you when you total it up when when Cunningham uh, wrote Doctors and Grays, um, and I don't think he realized some of the earlier hospitals that Hines missed. Um, mm -hmm. But great North Carolina ranks third in the Confederacy behind Virginia and Georgia uh, when it came to total number of hospitals that operated here in North Carolina. You know, and back on that wayside concept, I mean, that's purely a Confederate uh, idea, uh, technique. The Federals didn't have anything really like it. Um, the purpose of a wayside hospital was was for uh, transient soldiers. Most of them, for example, one of the techniques that they would use to help clear beds in, in the hospitals in Virginia would be to furlough a soldier home for 30 or 40 days. Uh, and those soldiers would be traveling on the railroad down the Wilmington and Rail Weldon. Um, and so they would get sick along the way. And, and the ladies in South Carolina picked up on this. And it's more like um, you, you come in, you need to get your bandage replaced, or all of a sudden you caught a cold on the, right. on the road coming home, or you just need a hot meal. And for a lot of these soldiers, especially those from the deep south that's coming from the Army in Northern Virginia, you know, they get to Wilmington and they're waiting on their connecting flight. <laughs> OK, we use a modern term there. But the, yep. the next flight, the next train doesn't lead till the next day. So where do they go? Right. Who, who's going to feed them? Uh, where do they go for a meal? Where, where do they go to where to go to sleep at? And and, and the ladies picked up on this. And, and you didn't necessarily have to be sick if there was a bed available and you needed a place to stay. Um, that you were allowed to go to the Wayside Hospital. And then the one Surgeon General uh, Warren here, Edward Warren here in North Carolina, North Carolina Surgeon General, when he established the Raleigh Hospital, the Raleigh Wayside Hospital, it's sometimes called the Ladies Wayside, 
it remained purely a state operated organization throughout the war. Um, he even allowed family members of sick or wounded soldiers that were in the Raleigh hospitals. Uh, when those families came in from a rural part of North Carolina, where were they going to stay? You know, mm -hmm. they had no place to stay unless they had family. Um, mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, with the prices of everything going up by 64, you can imagine that, um, you know, somebody from rural North Carolina going to visit her husband doesn't have a lot of money to begin with. Um, she's not going to be able to get a hotel room. So mm -hmm. it's the Surgeon Warren, Surgeon General Warren allowed the, the family members to stay in that hospital as, as well which I thought was really neat. I, I know I have read in somebody's account uh, that in Virginia, uh, they highly discouraged family members from staying with the patients when they came from out of town. Um, I think there's even one story about um, how this wife showed up who was pregnant and they actually had to deliver that baby while her wounded soldier <laughs> Uh, was uh, her wounded husband uh, was there um, in the hospital. Uh, so um, we're going to jump to a couple of our questions here in a minute, but I've got one more for you, Wade. Um, is there a North Carolina Florence Nightingale? Is there a nurse from North Carolina that had a really um, profound impact because, you know, there are some nurses that did leave accounts, um, not really any from North Carolina, but, um, is there one nurse that really stands out? One nurse that really stands out. Well, my favorite is Kate Sperry, uh, All right. um, who married the hospital steward Enoch Hunt at, at Goldsboro. Now she's a Virginia refugee. She's from right. uh, the Winchester area and her father sent her down to Goldsboro to live with her aunt. Um, but she, to me, she truly, when you read her diary, the, the great thing about that one as, as folks like you and I, we love diaries and journals, right? I mean, that's, oh, you yeah. can't get no better than that. Um, no. And, and she's, she's talking about the wounded coming in from Wise's Fork or Fort Fisher and stuff like that. But I, I found her commitment to, to the men in these hospitals, to the sick and wounded, because some in the South, some of these women were, it was frowned upon for them to even step in that hospital. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's one thing to go there to see your husband or your brother, but it's another thing to literally show up there at eight o'clock, eight, work eight to five in that hospital every day. Um, yeah. Because one, to, to look at another man who half naked body or, put your hand on someone who wasn't your family member that was really frowned upon. So for, for, for these women to do that. And what's interesting about Kate Sperry is that she writes in her diary, how her cousin in Goldsboro refuses to go to the hospital to even mm -hmm. step in that hospital mm -hmm. because she makes the comment after the battle of Wise's fork and general Bragg orders the evacuation of, of Goldsboro, everything towards Smithfield. Um, nurse uh, Sperry talks about, you know, her uh, husband came in, we're packing up, we're leaving. Her diary stops abruptly on March 11th and it picks right up on March 19th when she's there at the Barbie Wayside Hospital in, in High Point. They moved general number three all the way there. But she makes the comment in her diary is, I hope my cousin has to uh, take care of a Yankee soldier in the <laughs> hospital in Goldsboro because the Sherman, they knew Sherman was on the way there to Goldsboro. But I, I like her. I mean, there, there's some dozen examples. I've got several of them in, in volume one. Uh, uh, Jenny Wilkes out in Charlotte, obviously, she does a lot. Um, it's a couple of ladies from early on from Salem uh, who right. went north. There was a terrific uh, typhoid uh, outbreak, uh, just a lot of sickness, and a couple of the regiments from that area of North Carolina and Virginia. And they literally packed up everything and went up there and helped take care of these soldiers and came mm -hmm. home. Um, yeah. Awesome. It's, it's always great to find, as you said, those first person accounts, you know, the diaries and the letters. Um, and uh, that's, that's really um, what we, we are geared toward. Um, Sean uh, asked, um, are there, are the records that you use for your research public online? Are they only in the state museum? They're, they're everywhere. Uh, they are everywhere uh, from the National Archives to Raleigh, 
to the Southern Historical Collection. The Southern Historical Collection at Chapel Hill has a lot of uh, Dr. Haywood, Surgeon Haywood's uh, stuff from uh, number from number seven, the fairgrounds and the Pettigrew, number 13 hospitals in Raleigh. But National Archives, um, we are lucky in, in regards to uh, a lot of the North Carolina hospitals. There's a good fair number of them. Their patient registries or some kind of, because uh, uh, the, the surgeons in charge of these hospitals, I, the, administ the amount of administrative paperwork that he was required to submit every week, every month, um, to the Surgeon General was just amazing. Uh, he had time to take care of any kind of patients. Um, but we're fortunate that a lot of that stuff survives. Now, the problem is the early war hospitals, for example, the one on the front cover of my book, uh, mm -hmm. the Branch General Hospital in New Bern, that hospital was only around for about six weeks. And then when Burnside showed up and it was such a chaotic withdrawal from uh, New Bern by Confederate forces, all the records are, are gone. Um, right. so a lot of your early hospitals, very difficult, very difficult to track. Now, when, when we get towards mid-war period, 64, 65, believe it or not, there's, there's some, there's some good stuff out there. Um, but I find it back to the original question there, multiple avenues of approach. I mean, like I said, from the national archives in DC to Raleigh, to university collections, and then there are some things in some private collections. I mean, for example, I just, I just, because of my association with Wise Fork, I just picked up this week the original, that is the original list of wounded and killed from the Battle of Wise's Fork in Johnson Haygood's brigade at the Battle of Wise's Fork. This is, this is, this is coming up from the brigade uh, field hospital up to the there. So it's out there. Uh, you just got to hunt it. it. You're always hunting a rabbit down a hole. <laughs> always. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Always. Uh, David Pope asked um, that early on in the war, uh, there were a lot of um, church hospitals. Uh, are you finding a lot of church hospitals in North Carolina um, during the war? Yeah. Uh, especially in 65. Uh, right. You you will there. I will from yeah from Raleigh out to Charlotte, Greensboro and High Point in between. Um, the churches churches are used more as a uh, temporary when over when the when the main general hospitals are just overflowing, and that's what happened in Raleigh. You had all mm -hmm. the wounded coming in from Aversboro and Wise's Fork, and then boom, bam, here you got Bentonville and several thousand coming in, um, this quickly overwhelms the system. So they, they will start to use whatever they can, and churches make great temporary hospitals. Yeah. They're, they're big and airy, some of them, and um, big doors and all kinds of good things. So um, I think probably one of the most famous would be the one in Greensboro. Uh, they are um, – at that church site that was used after Bentonville. Um, that's the one that immediately sure. pops into my mind when, when the I Presbyterian read that church. Question. Yeah. Presbyterian yeah. church. Um, there. Um, let's see here. Uh, someone posted a minute ago, you were talking about, uh, the diary. The, is it, um, Sperry? Um, no, uh, is the diary that you were using from the, the, the lady, the Goldsboro nurse, uh, has it been published or I'm sorry? Actually, actually portions of it was in a magazine article. And that's okay. where, um, matter of fact, we were at the Bennett place. It was the right. gentleman who wrote the book on soap, d dysentery, disease. Yep. I, I can't yep. remember you know, what I'm talking about. Well, yep. he was there with us that day and he showed me that article on that. And that got me hunting her, her original her diary uh, transcribed is in was originally in the Museum of the Confederacy. And then all that source material was handed over to Virginia Library there in Richmond. So, right. yes, you can go there and see it. I mean, it's it, it's a wonderful. It's a wonderful. I mean, she's great. I mean, uh, if you're into genealogy and tracking your local historical society, old family, blue name, blue blood names and stuff from that area. She's got them because she's going to parties and tea events and 
hanging out with doing the social life kind of thing, as well as working the good stuff that I like that talks about the hospitals and such. Almost a Mary Chestnut there, except for Mary didn't work in a whole lot of hospitals. Yeah. <laughs> and even Devereaux, you know, I actually, I quote from, uh, you know, one of our, Miss Edmiston, um, you know, her nephew was mortally wounded or he died afterwards in a Richmond hospital. And that really inspired her because he was an officer. Um, she went up there to see him and because it, you know, they kind of kept the officers separate and it was just for North Carolina uh, officers. Um, and, but the, the, met, the head matron there complained that because they were officers, you know, uh, they didn't get the same amount of the hospital did, did not get the, because officers had to pay for everything uh, when it comes right. to their service, you know, honestly, yep. you're not the enlisted, you're not a private in the ranks who gets three hot meals a day to theoretically, you know, uh, uniform rations and whole nine yards. So uh, they, she really was inspired. They came back to Halifax County and they were constantly raising uh, foods and stuff and stuff to send up the Wilmington Weld and up towards uh, that area to donate food wise to that hospital. So, and there's another good diarist here in North Carolina, you know, Miss Edmondson there. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, there were some stories in there about her um, raising chickens and selling eggs to raise money to donate to the hospital and selling eggs to the hospital and donating stuff and uh, just just lots of good stuff uh, out there, which a lot of times we don't hear about. You know, it's it's Virginia, 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 a little Tennessee, North Georgia. Uh, and, um, North Carolina kind of really gets left out of that equation. Um, yeah. And we, and we were somewhat, you know, we're somewhat lucky because of Wilmington and as the yeah. war drags on Wilmington is, you know, the, the last of the major blockade running ports there. That's just somewhat successful. Uh, yep. Marianne Bowie, um, was a socialite town in Wilmington, but she was notorious. I mean, she hit up every blockade running captain when when they came in to port and it wasn't nothing for them to hand over a 25 pound bag of coffee or a, a nice. bushel of oranges or something coming in from, you know, from Bermuda or wherever. Um, but she was big on that. And and the hospitals were somewhat lucky in that we, we they had that kind of. Um, with the blockade running that some states don't ha didn't have it, you know? So yeah. we were somewhat lucky in regards to those local area hospitals down there really benefited from it, especially with efforts of this buoy. Yes. So Corey Mercer asked, uh, was there any hospitals during the war down in the Robeson County area? No, not no. that, not that I'm aware of now, you know, one of, one of the things that Dr. Chris Fonvel told me early on, he said, well, you really need to put this hospital thing in a sandbox because um, you're going to hear it constantly. You know, my grandmother said or the local lore says this house over here was used as a hospital. And, yeah. and chances are it, it could have been. Um, it was, but it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a large general hospital on the scale of of Peace College or or. Uh, the Goldsboro Female College, multiple story buildings with three or four hundred beds. It was nothing upon that like that. So private residences were often used as as um, I will tell you in that, in that area, Robeson County and, and, and Cumberland County in 63, there was a terrible yellow fever, uh, excuse me, smallpox outbreak. So it was not uncommon for for rural houses to be used, homes to be used as a pest house or a quarantine area. Um, or when the army's moving through there, and if there's a mm -hmm. skirmish or a battle near there, uh, yes, the surgeon is going to take over a home. It's much easier to use it as, as a field hospital, but then they move on. Uh, but I know of no Confederate general hospital. There's definitely no wayside hospital down there because there's no railroad. Um, but there's no general hospital down there because one thing is it's too close to Fayetteville. Uh, Fayetteville already had General Hospital Number Six, and in the Surgeon General, just too many hospitals in one area just doesn't doesn't is not a good resource. Yes, um, and and I'll I'll drop a explanation point there um, to what you said about all of these little stories. Um, William Charter wrote in Bushwhackers, uh, part of that three volume series that he did on North Carolina mm -hmm. in the War, uh, that there was a Confederate hospital in Elk Park. 
in Avery County. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's no Elk Park. Elk Park does not exist until the 1880s. Uh, I mean, there, there's there's nothing there uh, to have a hospital. There's no reason to have a hospital. Uh, and um, just little stories that you have to sift through, um, you know. You know, and one, one of the things I, I plan on I plan on doing, Michael, is, you know, I may come out with a volume three just just focuses on the, the, the Confederate as well, but more more of data and statistics and stuff like that kind of related. Right. Um, but one of the things I, I, I want to do is is an appendix that lists all these. Um, when when I usually done with a presentation, someone will come up to me and say this house over here in Jones County was used during yeah. Foster's raid on Goldsboro right. or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just going to list it, you know, give me the address, give me the GPS coordinate, give me what background you have. Uh, right. If I can't find a primary source, and that was one of my list tests, you know, I've got to find a primary source that links that a, a diary letter, journal, some kind of hospital record, something, you know, but when I couldn't, I mean, at least I'm going to, develop that list because you know what, when you and I are gone here, there's some young sixth, seventh grader right now is going to be aspiring PhD student sometime. And, you know, and, and they're going to, they're going to find out more information. Who knows with the right. way the internet is nowadays and more and more, more and more records are becoming digitized and online. I'm at least going to have that as a mark on the wall as potential yep. sites for hospitals that, or yep. that deserves more research if it's yes. available. I mean, there's still stuff hid in people's attics, even to exactly. this day. It's just uh, like that, those rec it's, you know. it's just like that Kaiser report of Hagen's yep. Brigade from Wise's Fork. It was in squirreled yep. away in someone's uh, private collection, and now all of a sudden it became available. Yep, yep. Um, good stuff. Um, so, uh, one other question that I want to ask, and um, did how did the Confederate hospital system? Uh, deal with federal prisoners because there were tons of federal prisoners that moved through North Carolina heading to Florence and um, Andersonville. Um, you know, did, did they, were they just left on the train? Um, no, actually, and, and actually, you know, I think you mentioned it um, um, with Plymouth, for example, right. some of the, the, the sick and wounded at Plymouth union federal soldiers are, uh, or either, um, I, for example, one in that, that article that you sent me, they, some of the soldiers were evacuated up to Petersburg. There was one wounded federal soldier in that group of, uh, primarily Virginia soldiers that were wounded right. at, at Plymouth, but you see them also, uh, they're not the first ones out the door. They're going to take care of the Confederate wounded first, get them evacuated. But ultimately, um, when there's no more Confederates to be evacuated, they were sent to, for example, after the Battle of Plymouth, they're they're sent to Raleigh, mm -hmm. and and they're in general they're in the Fairgrounds Hospital, number seven. Um, um, Surgeon Haywood's got a list of their names and their rank and what's wrong with them, the whole nine yards. And then, you know, three or four days later, there is a list where he turns them over. Those that are now fit for return to duty are turned over to the Provost Marshal in Raleigh, who in turn gets them on a train and they're headed towards Salisbury. And many of them ultimately Andersonville and stuff like that. But we see it in Nurse Sperry's diary um, right. with when Salisbury was shut down in early 65. And you have all the prisoners from Florence that's coming along the railroad. Um, they come through Goldsboro before they're, they do the, the, the big prisoner exchange down there on the Northeast Cape Fear River right after Hope gives up uh, Wilmington. Um, what's interesting about that is there's about three dozen of the guards that were guarding those this from specific Georgia regiment. I want to say the 47th, but don't hold me on that one. Um, that literally contract uh, typhus, typhoid. Mm -hmm. They're because of the disease and sickness and their exposure to these federal prisoners um, they wind up becoming incapacitated with some kind of disease and non-battle injury. But yes, union prisoners, you will see them. We see them at the Barbie Wayside Hotel. They'll mm -hmm. pop up on the air every now and then. Um, that was in high point. Normally, 
it's normally it's because they can't continue on the rail journey to Salisbury or even down into the deep south towards Andersonville or later on to Florence. All right. Cool. Uh, so um, your editor, publisher, Keith Jones, wants to know uh, what is the biggest find from the 1863 and before period that you have discovered that you would have liked to have had in volume one? What's the biggest discovery? Yeah. What did you find um, that you wish you would have had when you published volume one? What have you found? Oh. Some little piece. Of yeah. You, you'll like this one, Michael general hospital number 10 in Charlotte. Yeah. I, I, if you notice that very last map I use in the 1863 chapter at chapter, as I'm closing it out, I right. list general hospital number 10 in Charlotte. Right now, when I finally, when finally, when COVID was over and I got back into the national archives, mm -hmm. I got all the weekly reports, which are consolidated mm -hmm. by general hospitals and wayside hospitals. And mm -hmm. it's a great report. I'm really into numbers. Um, and it also talks about personnel and stuff like that. But all of a sudden, general hospital number 10 drops off the map. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not it's not it's OK for like they miss one week. Maybe something was going on, like the Battle of Plymouth or something. Something they were too engaged, taking care of stuff to, to right. do a weekly report. But guess what? It Week two, three, four, five, six. I'm like, whoa, what happened to number 10? Mm -hmm. It just they shut it down. Because at that time, Charlotte really was not that area or region of the Piedmont was not overwhelmed yet. Right. With, with sick and wounded. The the right. connection between Danville coming down, like the Lynchburg hospitals and stuff, that connection coming down through Danville into the Piedmont area at, at Greensboro, you didn't have that connection yet. All you had was the Petersburg line coming down to Weldon. Um, so when number 10 dropped off the map and all that was in Charlotte for, for until the s May, May of 64 mm -hmm. was the wayside hospital. And then general hospital number 11, which is now the new hospital in Charlotte, all of a sudden appears. And when you peel back the onion, what's interesting, Mike, I just found this out is that, 14 of the of the wounded soldiers in that Charlotte hospital in early May. Right. They're coming from your battle that you're writing about. Plymouth. About Plymouth. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. That's what that, yeah, I wish I would have known that. I mean, I definitely got to go back and but you know, like you say, you you're always finding something. <laughs> always. I mean, just always finding something. And then of course, you know, I've experienced, you know, something that I found 20 years ago that I wish I had now that I have no idea, you know, the, the, it's the, it's up here in my brain, but where I found it and what I saw it, because, you know, at the time it's like, I'll never need that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Now I don't know where it is. So Skip Smith, uh, to close us out this evening, uh, if you want to talk about something else, that's great. But Skip wants to know if you could give us a quick wise fork update. Yeah. Yeah, I can. Uh, but look, look, before uh, let me, I'm looking at some of these questions here, and and okay. I and I, I cl I'll, I'll close with it. What where was number six? Where was number I, I see six? Where someone wrote number six is that, and, and the reason I highlight this question, Michael, is because it's real. Number six the was really in it started in Smithfield, North Carolina, which which is modern day Southport. Okay, and actually. It, it was later numbered number six, but it was really the very first general hospital, Confederate Army General Hospital, established in North Carolina several months before the Fairgrounds Hospital in Raleigh, which traditionally people hold as the very first one in North Carolina. But number six was in Smithfield. Uh, but then because it was very small, barely 40 some beds, inefficient we throw a, a surgeon and steward there. And oh, by the way, 15 miles up the river, you've got, you already have two general hospitals in Wilmington that are very large. Well, at least one of them is very large. So the surgeon general had, they shut down number six in Smithfield, North Carolina. But 
in the summer of 63, they reopened number six to Fayetteville, North Carolina. When Fayetteville got its first general hospital, it became the new, the second location, the new number six. And, and, you know, when I was writing on Sherman, I knew about general hospital number six in Fayetteville, but I never knew that wasn't the first number six in North Carolina. It was, it was the, uh, the one down in Smithfield. That would have made it easier just to keep numbers. <laughs> uh, I wonder, you know, that hospital in Southport, um, was there a Naval hospital there prior to the war? Um, or prior know, to the war? I, I, I don't know. And, and I'll tell you, that's one of, there's two challenging things for writing on the Naval hospital. The Confederate Naval hospitals are, there's just not a lot of information out there. Right. Um, you see sailors, Confederate sailors, uh, all the way out into the hospitals out in, in for example, in Barbie Hotel and High Point. You'll, you'll find their names on those lists there and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but there's not a lot of records on the on the Confederate Naval hospitals. Yes, Wilmington had one. Yes, mm -hmm. they did. But finding any kind of patient register or any kind of records, nah, I've had no luck. Uh, no luck on the Confederate Naval aspect. Uh, for example, one of the first Confederate Navy hospitals was on Ocracoke Island. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do know that because I found I found a letter. It happens to be just one little document written in 1861 mm -hmm. that said, you know, Ocracoke Naval Hospital. On it. Um, so I know there was one there, but that's the only thing I've ever found in relation to that hospital. But of course, Ocracoke falls really early in the war. You're not going to find much right. about that. Yeah. All right. Um, awesome. Um, um, if we want to end it on that, we can, or we keep on going. Yep. So, uh, that's fine. Let's, let's finish up on wise fork and, uh, we will, um, go from there. Yeah. Um, right now we're kind of, we had our, we had our, um, meeting back in November with all the major stake state players and uh, when I let's back up for a second and wade let's back up for a second uh wise fork was a 1865 battle in north carolina none of the field is all that preserved uh, most of it's still farmland and yeah it's uh, still it, for those of you who have ever traveled between new Bern and kinston it's when you're coming from new Bern, it's right before you you before you get to the community college about a mile and a half two miles back towards new Bern. Um, about 4,000 acres is on the National Historic Registry. So it's a very large battlefield itself. Um, when we look at it from that perspective, for, to put it against Bentonville, Bentonville is around 6,000 acres. So that kind of gives you the battle space. Now, the numbers are not as big as Bentonville, no, but clear no lot. Um, but the battlefield itself of those 4,000 acres right now, probably about... Uh, Pushing close to 200 acres is preserved. Uh, a battlefield trust just recently picked up a little bit, 80, 80 plus acres um, that, was, that was preserved. And there's some wonderful trench lines there, uh, uh, Confederate trenches, more like works, excuse me, I should say works. Um, mm -hmm. That was, that began construction in 62, it still exists, about 100 acres of those. Um, so no, um, that's about it right now from a preservation perspective. Uh, the battle itself was the first of four, four fault here in March of 65. Um, the, Conf the Federals coming out of Newburn are trying to get the railroad over to meet Sherman in Goldsboro. I mean, he put his finger on his map and said, meet me in Goldsboro mid-March. And that's what they're trying to do, to have all right. kinds of food and ammo and new uniforms and stuff for Sherman before he continues north towards Virginia. So that's the purpose of uh, the Battle of Wise's Fork. You've got some well-known, noted Confederates there, Braxton Bragg, Daniel Harvey Hill, Robert Hoke, Johnson Haygood, uh, uh, and a host of other generals as well. Right. A whole lot of generals, not very many privates. Let's put it that way right. in 65. So um, the, the state of North Carolina wants to. Yeah. The North Carolina the DOT, I-42, yeah. Interstate 42, that's going to run between Raleigh and, and Moorhead City. Um, there is a planned interchange right on top of the Union line on March 9th and March 10th of the battle. Um, that proposed interchange 
55 acres is the normal standard footprint for a uh, inter interstate interchange. So you can quickly imagine what that would do to the battlefield. Plus when you add what normally you have, Bojangles and everything else around that interchange, the battle, the battle is, feels, is gone. Um, so we've been fighting for a couple of years now. We've, we're looking at, uh, um, in November, we had a stakeholder meeting, stakeholders being Department of Transportation, Army Corps of Engineers, State Historic Preservation Office, a whole number of other hosts of folks, um, some folks in the local Civil War roundtables were there. And then, of course, the organization that I'm part of, the nonprofit arm of uh, uh, Historic Preservation Group there in Lenore County, uh, the Save Wise Fork Battlefield Group. Um, and the good news that came out of that was the DOT is at least looking at shrinking that, that standard 50 plus acre footprint down to about 30 acres. And the proposal that was made was to move it about a quarter to a half a mile back towards Newburn. It will essentially put the interchange in the Union rear area at that time, but it saves where the heavy fighting was uh, on, on March 9th and March 10th. Now that was right. It was in November. So they said, we'll get back with you early 2024. Um, our organization just received a letter from the Secretary of Transportation here in North Carolina and saying that here shortly they will be contacting all the stakeholders um, and we will get together and they'll tell us wow they think they can make this happen. Um, so we're still kind of we're in the ninth inning of a, of a baseball game <laughs> uh, or fourth quarter of a football game. We're close, um, but we're waiting to see if our proposal to have them move it to shrink it. And then they have a whole pot of money for mitigation that they will purchase some of the land around it. We're looking right. at about 50 some acres more purchase around and that will preserve the battlefield or at least that right. core part of the battlefield. Right. Um, the rest of it's pretty rural in nature of farmland and stuff, but I think it's a great start. I mean, yep. I, I always tell people the story of Bentonville when Dr. Bradley wrote the book back in 1995, Bentonville was only, 221 acres out of 6,000. Let's fast forward to 2024. Over 2,100 acres is now preserved at Bentonville, almost a third of that battlefield. Yep. So that's all awesome. it takes is you just got to get the ball rolling, and, and, and that's yep. a good thing. Yep. Good thing. All right. Fantastic. Uh, so I think that's going to wrap it up for this evening. If you want to know more about um, Wise Fork, uh, there's a great Facebook page uh, about that. You can check that out. Uh, if you are interested in um, Wade's book on Confederate hospitals, uh, let me encourage you to um, check that out. You can visit the publisher site, uh, Fox Run Publishing. Uh, you can also go and um, you can check it out on, if you have to, on Amazon or some of the other, I'm sure, museums, uh, Fort Fisher and other places probably have that in stock, um, often in stock. Uh, and let me encourage you to get out there and uh, check out North Carolina's Confederate Hospitals and check out the Wise Fork Battlefield. Wade, anything else you'd like to share with us this evening? No, I appreciate the opportunity to come on and, and thanks for the platform. And uh, I will also throw out there, hey, just visit one of our state historic sites like Bentonville or Wise yep. Fork, CSS News, Fort Fisher, Anderson. They've got the they've got copies of all three of my books. So, uh, um, yeah, you can always go there and help 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 the help the site to get it from. Yep. Them. Fantastic. All right, folks, thank you so much for joining us. Sunday night history chat. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday night. Uh, Lord willing, y'all keep researching, digging into history and sharing it. Uh, God bless.